The One Happy Diabetic video you're about to watch contains content that was created based on our unique experiences with diabetes and should not substitute for the advice of medical professionals. The opinions expressed in this video do not reflect those of our employers, doctors, friends, or favorite grocery store checkout person. They are solely our own. Enjoy! My name is Yogi from DiabeticRadio.com and this is my second video for the One Happy Diabetic Project. You know, I realize that we are in a lot of trouble. A lot of us diabetics are still in a lot of trouble. And we are in a lot of trouble because um, still when a lot of people find out that they're diabetic for the first time, you know, when they hear those words uh, from their doctor, the first thing they think is, I feel fine. Or another common uh, response is usually, I exercise every day. I eat right. How is it possible that I can have diabetes still? I think you've made a big mistake, doctor. I don't have diabetes. I feel perfectly fine. You know... There's a reason why they call diabetes the silent killer. It's for that reason. You don't normally don't feel a thing. Um, and by the time you do feel something, um, a lot of damage has already been done um, by your body. Um, believe me, if a doctor tells you you have diabetes and he tells you why, uh, he gives you your A1C numbers. And you think that you still feel good and there's nothing wrong with you. Believe you me. Something is a stewing in your body. Something is a stewing. You know, and the other thing is, um, I realized that when I was first diagnosed, um, I didn't, well, I felt things, but, you know, I've been feeling bad for so long that I didn't even realize it was a problem until I was diagnosed and I started doing other research and, and connecting with people uh, like me that have diabetes. To, you know, it, that's when I found out that so many things were wrong uh, with, with my body and, and what was uh, going on. My body was so accustomed to my high blood sugars, which is another reason why a lot of people don't feel anything, because your body has grown accustomed to the high blood sugars, you know. Um, my doctor told me that my A1C, the first time I was diagnosed, that my A1C was like 14.5, almost 15. Now, for some reason, that didn't click right away until I got home and um, I was trying to test my blood sugar for the first time, you know. And by the way, my first um, uh, glucometer, uh, uh, glucometer, excuse me, uh, was an AccuCheck. And I call them the vampire meters because all of the AccuCheck products require so much blood. It's like it, you can never seem to get enough blood with AccuCheck. <laughs> and when I first started, I had the, the, the strips that, that look like these big, uh, long pads. You know, you can see the fiber of the pads. And every time you squeeze all the blood out, it still wasn't enough. You know, um, today's meters, a lot of them, they give you like a little five second extra, you know, to squeeze not the AccuCheck, you know, um, once it tells you you didn't get enough blood, you know, um, that's it, you lost that strip, you know, um, and it was just so frustrating, because uh, I didn't have anybody to teach me, um, when I finally got my first number, it was, um, almost 400, and that was fasting, because that, because I figured, you know, I, I wasn't too sure uh, whether the doctor wanted to do more tests, so I decided to go in fasting, 
you know, and it was kind of late, and it was almost 400. And when the doctor told me that um, my blood sugar should be anywhere between 80 and 120 tops, and I got my first reading at almost 400, and I didn't even need anything yet. You know, that registered uh, with me. <laughs> and I said to myself, oh my goodness. So that meant that when I was eating, that I was walking around with blood sugars probably anywhere between six to 800, um, more likely. And by the time I got my blood sugars back to where it should be, which was another which was another experience onto itself because my if my, my body was reacting to that when I, when my blood sugar started getting to normal you do you know that my chest even felt like it was caving in i had so much problems trying to breathe you know as my body was getting um accustomed to the um normal blood sugars um it, it it was not easy. And thinking back, you know, I was so furious that my doctor didn't put me on insulin the first you know, time. I was watching a documentary because I told you guys I love watching, you know, everything, you know, old school. And uh, this documentary was um, about um, Africa when the, with the first start of AIDS um, and HIV. And no one knew what it was. It was the mysterious, you know, killer. And, um, I mean, with the exception of the fact that, you know, uh, uh, HIV is viral and diabetes is a combination of genetics and, you know, lifestyle. Um, um, it really bugged me out the, the the social similarities the more I watched the more I realized that a lot of the stuff that we go through you know um, as diabetics is kind of similar to um, HIV in a way um, in that um, well HIV is an epidemic diabetes is an epidemic and pretty soon diabetes is going to be the number one killer you know, every time I turn around, I look at the statistics and the numbers are just getting higher and higher and higher and higher. You know, it's unbelievable. When HIV first started, you know, um, and it was so rampant in Africa, a lot of people didn't believe that um, this uh, disease could exist, uh, could kill you. No, no one didn't even know how to get it. You know, um, and it was, it was, you know, it was terrible. Same thing with, uh, diabetes, you know, um, coupled with, I feel fine. I, I don't think I have nothing, you know, um, and then when people got wise, they found out that, you know, HIV, you catch it through sexual, you know, um, intercourse, you know, contact with fluids. You know, and no one didn't want to believe it. It's like, how could, you know, sex that feels so good can kill you? And the same thing with diabetes. How could, you know, when we eat, we enjoy our food. How could, how could something that tastes so good can kill us? We can't, we can't connect those things. You know, because so many of us don't understand the impact of, 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 of blood sugar, how blood sugar can literally destroy your body, can literally rot your body, you know, and I saw, and, and I remember this, you know, um, when uh, people finally started to realize, you know, finally decided to get educated and, 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 and know what HIV was and and how you get it, then the blame game happened, right? You know, everyone, you know, the, the, a lot of men in Africa felt that the women gave them AIDS, you know? 
when the fact of the matter is it was the men that was sleeping around all over the place. You know? Um, you know how many you know women were beaten because of that? And it's the same thing with HIV. I mean, it's the same thing with diabetes. You, you got diabetes because you ate too much sugar. You got diabetes because you ate too much. You got diabetes because, you know, whatever, whatever. It's your mother's fault. She made you eat all those candies. You wouldn't have had diabetes now. You should have had all your fruits and, you know, healthy fruits. You know? Without having any idea that the same damn sugar that's in the fruit is in a candy. You know? Um, it just really bugged me out. And, and, um, and then eventually people started to wise up. Or at least most of us. You know, you still got those people, some people out there who, you know, think that, you know, they won't get it or they can't get it. Same thing with diabetes. You know, I can't get it. I'm, I eat healthy. You know, I eat Brussels sprouts every weekend. You know, I eat carrots, you know, every day. You know, I shouldn't have anything. You know, diabetes is a complex disease. Extremely complex. More than people can ever realize. But most people don't realize it because they don't take it upon themselves to go out of their way to read about it. A lot of people's knowledge of diabetes is based on assumption. There's so many good books that you can read out there. A lot of people say, you know, how do you know so much about diabetes? Diabetes information is not this, you know, it's, 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 it's not only for um, doctors and, 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 you know, they're not this esoteric, you know, uh, scripture or something where only, you know, monks can have access to. You know, with the click of a mouse, a click of a mouse... A trip to the bookstore, which would be great exercise, by the way. You know, a trip to the bookstore. There are tons, tons. The American Diabetes Association has so many great books on diabetes. But you know what we do? We don't, we're too lazy. We don't want to go read the books. We would rather, you know, get advice from, you know, a cousin or a friend, rather than doing the work, playing an integral part in your own life, we rather take the easy way out. Diabetes is not easy. You know, just like HIV is not easy. And by the way, we don't talk about this much, you know, but diabetics need to be more careful than anybody else in terms of relationships, you know, in terms of intercourse, in terms of all these diseases that's out here. Why? Because we're the only ones that, ha that are constantly in contact with a needle. We always have needles, we're always pricking ourselves, we're always squeezing a little blood, we're always putting something in something, you know, some device to take care of our diabetes. You know, and we need to be aware of those things when we're uh, dating and when we're intimate with people because that's also uh, something extremely important as well as keeping um, ourselves healthy. You know, before you know it, the new year will be here. It will be 2012. And I think that this would be a good time to um, add some diabetes resolutions um, along with your other resolutions. It's to make a promise to ourselves, and that is include uh, myself, to do even better in terms of seeking diabetic information 
and learning more about our bodies and also teaching others about diabetes. You know, so that people that don't know about diabetes don't continue to think the same untruths about diabetes, don't have the same assumptions about diabetes, you know? And sometimes that even means doctors, you know? Um, unless the doctor is diabetic, most doctors don't know what it is to take, you know, insulin. They can't give you that um, advice from experience of taking insulin because they don't take it. All they know is that this is, you know, what you need when your blood sugars are out of control and when, you know, everything else fails. And this is where there's a separation between, you know, um, your doctor and living your life as a diabetic. This is where you, the, the, where you need to um, converse and find other diabetics um, who have experience with diabetes so, so that you can learn from them, so that, so that they can fill a part of your life that can't that you can't get from your doctor. Learning about diabetes is an ongoing process. It isn't just a one week seminar or a couple of do's and don'ts from your doctor. You cannot expect to learn everything from diabetes about diabetes from your doctor. The doctor just doesn't have the time to teach you everything. There's a lot to know. You got to take it upon yourself to read and whatever the questions you have about diabetes, hopefully your doctor, the next time when you uh, see your doctor, um, you can ask them all those questions uh, that you have from all the materials that you read about diabetes. It's so important. I really do hope that this video has been beneficial to you. And again, please make this a part of your diabetic resolution. Millions and millions and millions of people are being diagnosed with diabetes every year. And yet, each year that the numbers, diabetic numbers increase, it seems like diabetes awareness decreases at the same time. We got to grab the bull by the horns and be serious. You know, diabetes can take your sight, it can take your quality of life, it can take your life altogether. And my diabetic brothers, please, men are notorious for not wanting to go to the doctor. Please, you have to take care of yourself. If not for yourself, at least think about your loved ones. Think about the loved ones who have to watch you deteriorate because of stubbornness, because you don't want to go to the doctor, because you don't think that there's anything wrong with you, knowing damn well that even if you think that there really isn't anything wrong with you, just to be on the safe side, go to the doctor and get yourself checked out. It does get better. So once again, my name is Yogi from DiabeticRadio.com. And uh, this video is for the One Happy Diabetic um, Project. If you're watching from YouTube, um, please don't forget to visit OneHappyDiabetic.com. We have a lot of good um, material, helpful uh, material for both experienced and newbies um, to help you uh, learn more about diabetes and help you to uh, manage diabetes. Um, those of us um, that are in the One Happy Diabetic team, um, Bill, Mike, uh, Susan, uh, Ryan, we are all working very hard uh, to bring quality information to you. So um, give us a visit. And also, don't forget to visit 
diabeticradio.com. Thank you. For generations, Africans have faced and overcome adversities. Today, we in Africa and people worldwide are gripped by a great tragedy which is hidden yet all around us. We ourselves, our loved ones, our communities and our way of life are threatened. As we have before, we will overcome this disaster. First, we must face it without turning away. These are people with HIV disease. Real people from Cameroon and Zimbabwe with the courage to talk about AIDS. They are mothers and fathers sons and daughters, wives and husbands. Many will stay healthy for some time. Others are already quite ill. Do you have an idea of what you're sick with now? Yes. What can it be? It is the illness of the century, uh, as it is called... Uh, What is it called? AIDS. Do you think it was possible you could have this disease even before you were told? No. You did not think you might have the disease that everyone is talking about? No. Why? Because I did not think this disease existed in Cameroon. You did not know it existed in Cameroon? I heard about it, but I didn't believe it. If people don't believe it exists, maybe people need to have a case like mine. Myself, I did not believe it. Now that I see my daughter's case, well, I'm starting to be convinced that there is such a disease. How long will it be until we all admit AIDS exists? And then how long until we treat it as a social crisis as well as a medical crisis? Doctors too have much more to treat than physical symptoms. Each case is quite personal. And sometimes it is the beginning which is the most difficult because you don't know how to tell these patients that they have AIDS. And when you do, you feel like you are witnessing their life, leaving them. They are so stunned. They are stupefied. And then you have to try to cheer them up to explain. You must listen to them, talk to them. So the responsibility is quite big for one person. What did you feel when you were told you had AIDS? I wanted to kill myself. I wanted to take the poison to die. And then you advised me, cancelled me, and it made me calm down. Was your family aware about the type of illness you had? Yes, doctor. And what did they say when they learned about the illness you had? They said I brought them shame, that I have to endure it alone because I brought shame on the noble family. 
When her son learned that she had AIDS, he abandoned her. Her two children actually abandoned her, saying that their mother had shamed them. So she is a woman who lives only with her younger sister, who did not abandon her. And what do you think of your other brothers and sisters who rejected her? I'm not in touch with them anymore because I'm on her side. So they don't take care of you anymore because you stood with her? It means the two of you are abandoned then? Yes. Rejection does nothing to stop the spread of AIDS. But AIDS can be stopped. Allowing AIDS patients to speak out freely will help, but many patients are afraid to talk. Well, at first I was ashamed to tell anybody. Only the doctor and I knew about it. So besides the doctor, nobody else knew? Why? Because people are going to laugh at me behind my back. What about your wife, if she knew? Oh, it would be a catastrophe. Why? I don't know. She wouldn't be able to handle it. Will she go away? Of course. Of course, she would go away. Even though African solidarity is something very strong, I must admit that we are seeing in one patient out of three, which is a lot, which is enormous, we are seeing terrible things that we are not used to in Africa. Mutual support within families and communities has been one of Africa's greatest strengths. When support fails, the isolation is doubly painful. Nicole has only her father to rely on. But when he heard she had AIDS, his first reaction was to blame her. After the doctors told me that she had it, I realized right away that she contracted it by slipping around. Immediately her father reacted and even said, that is what you are looking for in the streets. Here is your reward. I tried to calm the father down by telling him, no, you must not brutalize the patient, and he went home. But what is most disturbing is that since the father was told about the diagnosis, he seems to be abandoning his daughter. He tells himself, why spend the money on someone who will die? I'd rather spend it on raising the other kids. He'd rather give up on her. Your father does not support you? No one does? I am alone. And the rare times her father comes, when I tell her that he is here, she displays such joy. She tells me, my father, where did you see him? I say, he is in the courtyard, he's coming. She says, are you sure he is coming? It is so comforting for her when she knows her father is here. But the fact that he does not come by regularly makes her feel rejected. Abandonment by her father means more than emotional pain for Nicole. She needs his support to continue fighting her disease. We have also seen families coming together. The fact of coping with an unusual fate will unite a couple in their joint struggle for their future together. So, we have seen positive things, not just problems. Tell us how you first reacted when you learned of your diagnosis. Nothing has changed. We decided to stay together until the end. We are not blaming each other. Tendai and her husband, Farai, 
learned they were both HIV positive when their baby died. That was two years ago. Both of us, we are infected. So we decided it's better if we can stick together and then help each other think, how can we live with it? The need for family and community support is urgent. How do you feel about the fact that your sister has AIDS? In the beginning, it was like there was a bomb that was about to explode in my heart. But I have seen so many people in the village with this disease and now know that I should not be alarmed. Now that we know she has this disease, we must support her. If I fall apart, what help is that? But if I stay strong, she'll even be stronger than I am. Marie lives on a small plot of land which she farmed with her five children. Her husband died two years ago. Last year, Marie suddenly fell ill and was diagnosed as having AIDS. Are you afraid to be beside your sister who has AIDS? Are you afraid to touch her? Are you afraid to live with her daily? <laughs> My sister remains my sister, do you understand? Even if I have to die for her, I will. But you cannot get the illness by hugging or eating together. Only sexual intercourse. No, I am not afraid of her. A family's love and a doctor's skill and dedication can overcome many things, but not all things. Does knowing the final outcome lessen the pain? The young person we were supposed to interview, he won't unfortunately be here because he has passed away. He was a young 24-year-old man who had accepted to talk for, as he was telling me, to bring something to science. He wanted to testify because he wanted to help science because he was saying it is thanks to other testimonies that we could help him and soothe his pains until he died. The tragedy of this epidemic is not limited to adults. Children too have AIDS and they too must be cared for. Five-year-old McCloudy has AIDS. It's now five years since McCloudy's mother died. She died when he was nine months old, before he could even walk. So I have become his mother. His real mother was my older sister. I just took it upon myself to look after her child. The way I care for my children is the same way I care for him because the pain my sister went through to have this child is the same I went through to have mine. If it was me who had died, my sister would have looked after my children just as well. Mark Cloudy will probably not have a chance to grow up, but most children will. Many have already lost parents or will lose parents to AIDS. Their loss will be with all of us for years to come. Yet Africa's future rests on its children's shoulders. Strong, adaptive and full of hope, our children carry a heavy burden. 
They need our help and our protection. We must teach them how to prevent AIDS. Farai, my first born, and Kumbirai, my second one, and Rosie, the third child. Unfortunately, I had another fourth one who died. Auxilia's youngest child died of AIDS. Her other children are healthy, but Auxilia herself has HIV disease. She belongs to the generation of adults who should lead Africa into the next century. But in many places, her generation is being decimated by AIDS. The most difficult thing is I wish I, I had longer life and also to look after my children and uh, to educate them. I'm going to Taiwan too. I'm just waiting, and only it's only that time becomes very hard when I think, how are these kids going to survive? And I wish I didn't have had children before. If it was only me, I'm not leaving any problem for anyone. Despite everything, Auxilia does not give up. And if she does not, how can we? AIDS can be prevented and will be defeated if we all join in the effort. Those of us who are not infected and those of us who are. I think it's the high time we remove the stigma from people about AIDS. Because when TB was there, people were afraid and so many people died before the medicine came. And leprosy came and People were afraid of seeing people with leprosy, but now they, they can talk it with, about it in public. Why not with AIDS? People might think that it's only me and my wife who are HIV positive, and they think they are free from the, uh, the virus. But it can be one day when one can get contract uh, the virus. So I appeal to the people. And again, I want to appeal to those who are HIV positive already, who have tested HIV positive that it's not the end of the world. We are still sailing in the same boat with others. So let's try and cope up. Let's try and live with AIDS. The faces of AIDS are no different from any others. They look like people we know and work with, and people we love. Our response to AIDS reveals our true selves and what we value most. Our children, the children yet to come, and the future of Africa depend on us. Mm -hmm.